Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Well, my name is Pastor Jody Wood, in case you don't know. Those of you who do know, we get the opportunity here to give Pastor Ryan a little bit of a break as he is preparing for Christmas Eve and beyond. And it is my privilege and honor to be here to share God's word um, in what I believe is a very, very powerful word uh, because he's helping me to see some things. How many of you know that just because we are up here and we prepare and we preach that it doesn't mean that we also have to be taught first, right? And, um, and, and, and I'm having to really try to understand a little bit more about God's incredible love, his incredible love. I love this time of the year. It's the most wonderful time of the year, isn't it? Yes, amen. And you know what the funniest thing about it is? That the world also celebrates with us, but they have no idea what they're celebrating. You know, when I was growing up, I had no idea. I was just, just looking for gifts, and there was nice little lights on Christmas trees and all of this other stuff, and now I kind of look at it from a different angle. I love lights. I love to drive in neighborhoods and, and just see. Have you ever been downtown Dover? And you see the wonderful lights there. And, um, and a lot of believers sometimes were like, that's not Christmas, it's too commercialized. You know what I see when I see lights? I see God, the light of this world, coming down and puncturing the darkness of our, you know, horrible world that is going on right now. And Jesus is love. Now, I don't believe in white lights, okay? So if you have white lights on your Christmas tree, get rid of them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we got to have some color, right? So I love that color. And so, you know, I just want to give you a, a different reason to kind of look at this season that we have here uh, called Christmas. And it all is about God's incredible love. It is about Emmanuel, it is about God with us. It is about the fact that we have a Savior who came to this earth, and we're going to talk about this today, who came to this earth, and he lived his life, and he died a, a horrible death, but he was raised from that death to give us eternal life. No other God has done that ever in the history of mankind. You know, and so I want to be able to talk about God's incredible love. And this is a perfect season to be able to do it, isn't it? You know, a little while ago, I, I preached on Psalm 103, and there was one verse I just want to. Oh, by the way, I want to welcome you at home as well as those of those here, because God is everywhere. He is there where you are right now. I don't care how many people are in your house. He is there with you. You may be by yourself, but you're not by yourself. Amen? Amen? And we're here praying for you as well. But this is a good season to understand God's love. Psalm 103, verse 11 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the heavens are above the earth. So what God is trying to communicate is that his love is so great you can't measure it. I don't know, well, I do know. We all know that you can't go to Lowe's or Home Depot and get a measuring stick as high as the heavens are above the earth, right? There's no laser that you can point up and tell me how high that is. But God is pronouncing in the best way that he knows how to say, this is how much I love you. No matter what we go through, his love is there. And Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the good news is God loves us, and he also is not conditional in that love. He is completely unconditional. Whosoever will come to him. He came for each and every one of us. And I want us to understand that this Christmas season is that no one in this room and no one watching 
in this place here today and wherever you are is exempt from God's love. You may feel like it at times. And we may do things that may not necessarily honor that love. But I got to tell you, God is one that says, I don't really care because I died for you. Because I have come to give you life and life abundantly. You see, God's love is pure. But here's the problem. We cannot possibly understand the totality of his love and his character. We have flesh. Ever since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, our, limit, our um, understanding of God's love and character has been limited. And it is being affected by the enemy here even today. And because of the limitations, no wonder Proverbs 3, 5 says, and lean not on your own understanding. We are to trust in him with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. Whatever you think you understand God's love to be is thousands of times greater than you ever think. God's love is thousands and millions of times greater than what we could ever understand within ourselves. So in this Christmas season to talk about the God's love that is personified, Emmanuel, God within us, I want to take us to Hebrews chapter 4 because I want to take a look at an aspect of Jesus' life just for a minute. And it's kind of disconnected from the Christmas story, but it is, it is, it is just one part of Jesus' life as well as a lot of others, one part of Jesus' life that just exemplifies this idea of God's love. In verse 15 of Hebrews 4, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, or, in another translation, sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Wow. Can you imagine? We... You know, he was here on this earth for 33 and a half years and he lived his entire existence and he never sinned. We need a Passover lamb. We needed that one that could replace all of the sacrifices that were done in the Old Testament. And we needed him to be perfect. The perfect lamb without spot or wrinkle. And Jesus is that one for 33 years. I want you to think about his love from that angle. Because sometimes we have difficulty sinning after 33 seconds, right? When you think about what goes on in your head and you think about the things that we do, and Paul outlined it quite well in Romans 7, right? We do the things we do not want to do and the things we need to do or want to do, we can't seem to do. When I want to do good, evil's right there with me. It is a struggle. And Paul recognized that even in the Christian life. It's a struggle to live this life. And Jesus did it. I, I just, listen, this is the message. This is the message for this Christmas season is to understand the totality of what Jesus really did. The word sympathize also means to be compassionate, to experience empathy, to understand what we are going through. And the Greek word root means to suffer with. Jesus came down so that he could experience what we experience and suffer right along with us. When I was looking at some of the commentaries about this particular verse, some things really kind of stood out to me. One said this, to sympathize with another to the extent of entering into his experience and feeling his heartache himself. Can you imagine Emmanuel? He came to us. He is with us in order to experience everything that we have experienced. It was his purpose to do that. It points to a knowledge that has in it a feeling for the other person by reason of a common experience with that person. Has anybody ever experienced a, another person that is suffering or going through what you're going through? And, and when you talk, it just really gives you strength because it's like, I am not alone. I am not alone going through what I'm going through. And that person just kind of talks to me and says, you know what? I was there. I can help you to get through what you're going through. 
And there's nothing like that. And that's what this verse is really saying. He was tempted in every way. Now, he may not have the same temptations that you have, but I got to tell you something. It's not about what you're tempted by. It's the fact that you can overcome because Jesus overcame his out of his love. And so when you talk to somebody that's been where you are, it just gives you strength. And so you can talk to Jesus no matter what you're going through, no matter what is happening in your life. You can talk to Jesus because he totally understands. And that's what I'm talking about here today. Because then it goes on in verse 16 to say, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with shame. See, there's not enough people in the room to correct me, Ryan. Let us then approach the God's throne of grace with what? Confidence. Why do we approach God's throne with confidence? Because we have a high priest, Jesus, who did everything for us. We don't have to do anything but fight with his strength. We can't even do it ourselves. But can you imagine the God of this universe has given us the ability and the power to be overcomers and victors? through his love, so we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. We don't have to wimp out and be afraid of God's throne. Do you realize what happened when that curtain was torn in two? Oh, I got the wrong holiday, sorry. No. But that's so important because you can't have Easter without Christmas. You can't have his death without his birth and everything in between. It is the epitome of God's love completely. So let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I just love the Lord, don't you? So what I want to do is go to an illustration of this Hebrews 4 by going to the baptism and the wilderness experience of Jesus in Matthew chapter 3. And I'm going to start in Matthew 3, verse 13, because in order to understand the wilderness experience of Jesus and what he did here, we have to understand the baptism. In verse 13 of Matthew 3, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. Can you imagine the scene? Now, I don't know, maybe Jesus is the only one that could see what was about to happen. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, and testifying to those that were there, This, this is my son. I can't sound like God. Whom I love, with him I am well pleased. What a gift. I mean, Jesus had never heard this probably directly, but here he is in the baptism, and I don't think he was expecting it, but... Here he comes out of the water, and the dove comes down, and, and he hears the voice from heaven. And then we have John 4. And verse 1, it says, then. What does then mean? It's an event that follows the previous one, right? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. What? You know, have you, have you ever had a great Sunday and only have a bad Monday? I mean, you just had the greatest experience in the baptism. You hear your father say, this is my beloved son. And now God himself takes you into the wilderness and says, I'm going to let you be tempted by the devil. I had a professor one time that said, the reason why Jesus had to go out into the wilderness right after this particular thing is something ignited in his flesh. Okay? I mean, can you imagine... We know human beings with a fleshly nature, we kind of get puffed up a little bit, right? Yeah, somebody kind of compliments, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's who I am, you know? And, um, and so it, it goes to our heads a lot. But can you imagine, in order for Jesus to conquer his flesh, he had to feel it. 
And so this is the reason. It's because he had to do this. It was necessary at this time to conquer what was coming up inside of him. And I want to read this passage here in the first 11 verses. I'm not necessarily reading it because I'm I'm analyzing the temptations themselves. I am just simply amazed at what he did here. Okay? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days or 40 nights, he was hungry. (laughs) I think I'd be hungry in the first 40 minutes. But after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then, of course, how many of you know that the devil isn't going to stop after one? He's not going to go, Oh, okay, you got me there. I'm out of here. (laughs) Because if he, if he came back again to the Son of God, you know he's going to come back to us over and over and over again. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand in the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written. <laughs> yeah, the devil's really sneaky, isn't he? I just noticed what you did. I noticed you used the word. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to use the word too. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him four beautiful words. It is also written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you as if he had it to give to him, right? He said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. What a beautiful beautiful story. But what I want you to focus on isn't so much the temptations, as I said. I want you to focus on what must have been going on for these 40 plus days and nights. I mean, this isn't just three temptations. I can't believe that it was just three temptations. I mean, what you go through in 40 days and 40 nights, you can't even imagine the thoughts and the temptations and everything your flesh throws at you. But Jesus did. And he batted every one of them. And good news is, is that when you do that, the devil has to leave. When you put Jesus first, and the name of Jesus has all the power and authority so that the enemy has to leave you when you become strong enough and you use his power because he was there. Because we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with every weakness. And he was just, he just experienced everything that we do, yet was without sin. And when you have a need, you come boldly before the throne of grace to fight that battle. I have a couple takeaways, really, from this particular scripture. And the first takeaway to me is really powerful. It's simply this. Jesus conquered the devil. He conquered the devil. If this was a contest, it wouldn't even be close. It looks like it. But if you notice what Jesus did, he played tennis with the word. He said, you know, if the, if the word comes at him, he's going to come at, at the other person, the devil, with another word. So folks, understand that even though scripture sometimes is going through our head. And, 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 and this, you know, this is, okay, you want me to say that? All right. Folks, I got to tell you something. There is uninspired scripture. Scripture that is used without God's authority. And it was right here in this word. And I know for a fact in my Bible it says you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. So if you're here today and and you are hearing word, the word in your head and it's condemning you, that's not from God. 
Because God is, a God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. When God speaks, it confirms. Yes, it can, it can have a conviction and we go, ouchie. But that doesn't, it does not come with shame and guilt and condemnation. And so if you are sitting here today and you've studied the word and I have people had done that, you know, hey, I want you to outline the word. And they come back and they outline all the negative parts. It's like, that's not what God wants to do. He wants to lift you up and he wants to set you free. And you don't let the enemy use scripture against you. You let God set you free from anything in your life with the word. Amen? He conquered it because he used the word. Forty days. It was a major battle. It wasn't just a minor thing. I don't want to overlook these, these 13 verses, 11 verses here. This was tremendous, and it is an act of love. Jesus did this for us. He conquered. Now, it doesn't mean that he was done conquering the flesh. You don't understand what I'm saying. But he had to learn how to appropriate God's word and his pre the presence of his father to be able to overcome anything that was going to come his way. But he held on and he won and he won for us. Amen? Amen. Second takeaway. He wrestled the same way we do. I love that about God. He brought Jesus to this earth to be tempted in every way just as we are. Wow. Can you imagine? Now, it does not mean that Jesus was an alcoholic. And it does not mean that he was abused. And, you know, a lot of things that we have experienced in our lives. But what it does mean is that everything the enemy could throw at him, he conquered. He overcame. And so anything the devil, you know, throws at you, you can be overcomers through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he wrestled the same way we do. I remember a preacher one time who was, um, and, and I can't believe that some people actually believe this, but there was, a, I guess, people that do believe that Jesus didn't have the capacity to sin. You know, how could he really understand us? He was God. But what we forget is that he was human. And it was a unique thing that no other God has ever been able to experience. Can you imagine that? No other God in this universe has experienced life like we do. Emmanuel, God with us. And so this preacher was preaching and trying to illustrate this. And, and so he went to a man in the audience and he says, Sir, I will give you a million dollars if you get pregnant. And, of course, the, the preacher is saying, well, it's impossible for me to get pregnant, so it's not a temptation, right? And then he goes to a woman in the crowd, and he says, ma'am, if you get pregnant, I'll give you a million dollars. Now, see, because you have the capacity to do it, it makes it a lot more powerful to, to face, isn't it? And do you understand that Jesus wrestled? He had the capacity. I love the fact that he lived his entire life. He had the capacity to sin. He could have been trapped by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and everybody. He was challenged in every way and he absolutely succeeded every single time. Do you understand that? It's God's love. Jesus did that for you. I don't want anybody to leave without understanding he did that for you and for me. Don't anybody ever think that God didn't do anything for you or he doesn't do anything for me or he left me where I was or he did this and did that. He did it all. But we are kind of like filtered through our own experiences. But he wrestled the same way we do. Here's number three, which is very difficult for me. The greatest time to fight the flesh. <laughs> you don't ever want to pray this, but it, it's true. The greatest time to fight the flesh is when it is the most inflamed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Has anybody ever gone on a diet right after Thanksgiving dinner? It's easy, right? It's easy to go on a diet right after you've eaten all this food. But get hungry again. And guess what is harder? But it is at that time that Jesus fought his flesh. 
And because he never gave in, he knew the power of Satan's temptations. He fought the devil at the height of what he was going through. And I love what, what uh, the one commentator, Terry, as I was studying this, basically said this, because he never yielded to sin, we know that he faced more intense temptations. I just want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus himself, because he resisted every single impulse that the devil had for him, faced more than you will ever face in your life. <laughs> the same commentary says, most of us say yes to sin before Satan has thrown all his weapons of temptation at us. <laughs> it's like, as soon as you give in, he's got you. You're no longer battling anymore. Now you're feeling guilt and shame. Which, by the way, is another weapon of the enemy. But Jesus said no. As Satan hurled every arrow in his quiver, he resisted until he broke the power of Satan. And does that not say that we can break the power of Satan if we resist in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who understands everything that you have been through and no matter what you're faced with today, no matter what addiction, no matter what feeling, no matter what attitude, if you are angry and you are resentful or bitter or whatever it is, you can conquer everything because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You can't do it yourself. Don't even try to do it yourself. Only he who resisted temptation to the end knows its full weight. And if Jesus knows the full weight of what you're going through, does that now have a profound impact on his compassion for you? I just... Think about that. Ponder the greater capacity that Jesus had for compassion because he understands. No other God in this universe is going to understand where you are. But my God does. My God, he punctured the darkness and came down to this earth for you. And we celebrate it. And I don't want you to forget that when you celebrate Christmas this year. The power of God's love through Christ. The last takeaway is simply, each of us has to wrestle with our own specific flesh temptations. Everybody has to deal with your own specific ones. Because what tempts me is not what's going to be what tempts you. But I guarantee you the devil knows what yours are. You don't have to put a sign out in your house saying, devil, this is what I'm tempted by. He already knows. What you may have to do is put a sign that says, I am a conqueror through Christ. And you remind him what, he, what God did for you in your life. So here's the problem with the flesh and the sin nature as we've talked about it. Number one, it's always with us. We can't get rid of it. You're going to live until you die. You will have it. And so it, it behooves us now to not try to deny it, but to conquer it. We must fight it. Galatians 5 says this, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. Your sin nature is in conflict with your flesh. And you know, I've, seen, I've seen people say all the time, Man, when I, got, I became a Christian, life got hard. I don't know if I can take this. Well, then you don't know if you want to be in heaven. Because it is important to be overcomers. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You're not just a conqueror. You're not just victorious. You are more than a conqueror through him who loved us. But what that means is I have to submit to his power. And there is a battle that is going to happen. Let's settle into it. Let's just get our weapons together and let's fight it. I'm going to tell you three weapons that we're going to use. Secondly, the more you feed the sin nature, the more powerful it gets. I don't know if you know that or not. <laughs> as soon as you think a thought and then you give into it, it makes it more powerful. And especially if you've had years and you've given into the same thing over and over and over again. 
It has power. But it only has the power that you, listen carefully, it only has the power that you give it. Because then we can exchange that and we can say, we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I need your power. Because I can be in an addiction for 40 years and God still has more power for me to conquer that. No matter how much you've been in it, he has something better for you. Well, I've been angry for all these years. I don't know if I can ever forgive and, I, and let go of this resentment and hurt and bitterness. But yes, you have to. Because the devil will come to you and say, just stay that way. Go ahead, go ahead. The devil loves the status quo. I don't know if you knew that. He loves the status quo. But God empowers us through the battle because we have a God that wins. Jesus conquered the devil in the wilderness. And thirdly, before we begin to close, always remember that the flesh only shows the short-term benefit of something and never the long-term consequence. So if we enjoy so much, hey, I've got to tell you something. Let's say that, you know, you have a sin in your life and, you know, and it's powerful. If you like it 2%, it's going to come after you. It's like you're heating your home and you leave your front and back doors cracked and think it's closed. We have to close the door. And the way to close the door is to invite Jesus completely into that area of our lives, which means we have to be willing to say no to ungodliness. That is so powerful. But folks, I'm just trying to help you to, say, to see that God loved us enough to send Jesus, the power of Jesus, the righteous name of Jesus to set you free. So I want to close with this. What do we do? All right? What do we do? There's three things I want us to focus on as we go through the holiday season. Number one, we need to saturate ourselves with the word. Saturate with the word. I want you to take a bath in the word. I want you to, if you don't like to take a bath, I want you to take a shower in the word. If you don't like to do any of that, get a swimming pool of God's word and jump into it. But the point is, we have got to immerse ourselves in his word. It's the only thing that has the power to overcome. You will know that truth. If you, and by the way, that's John 8, 32, right? If, you know, then you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Do you know what John 8, 31 says? Because many times we quote John 8, 32, but not 8, 31. And John 8, 31 is conditional. It says, if you hold to my teachings, then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Wow, you, you got to saturate, folks. But what does that mean? If you hold to my teachings. So you got to know to hold. You got to know what it is to hold on to the teachings. Then you are his disciples. And then you'll know. So you hold to his teachings. You become his disciple. You become a follower of Christ. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. One time I was, I was thinking about that scripture. And I did the reverse of it. And it made even more sense. And the reverse is like this. If you do not hold to my teachings, you are really not my disciples. Then you will not know the truth. And the truth will not set you free. The truth still exists, doesn't it? The truth will always be for you. But is it setting you free? We've got to saturate. Folks, every single day, get in the Word. Every single day, do scriptural topical studies. Look at something that you are struggling with and do a study about it. Like if you struggle with anger, get a concordance. You know, that's one of those things that lists all these words. And, and everything is done online now. You get BibleGateway.com. There's so many different Bible apps. And you could just put a word in there and it'll give you all the scriptures on it. Be purposeful. In studying the word. It's like eating a meal with no utensils. 
You need something to help you to overcome. And it is the one thing that can deliver us is the word. Amen? Secondly, we need interpersonal accountability. I, I, just, I just can't say this enough. You know, you heard Pastor Ryan's vision for the church in discipleship and small groups. The Bible says that two are better than one. Because if one falls down, who is there to pick him up? And we're going to fall, folks. Don't, you did not hear me say today that you're not going to wrestle with the flesh. You did not hear me say that you're going to be 100% successful. Not anybody in this room is going to be 100% successful. I may think one thing wrong next year. I don't know. It's all Dorothy's fault, whatever it is. We're all going to sin today. I'm going to tell you that. We're going to do something, think something, feel something. We're going to do something. But Jesus is here for us. It is not how many times we do it. It is whether God has control of our lives. And we, sometimes we need somebody's help. We need to be able to be in a small group. We need to be able to have a sponsorship. Listen, to me, a lot of these addiction groups, they know what it's all about because they will give you a sponsor. And if you have a problem at 2 o'clock in the morning, they will say, call me. Don't succumb to your temptation. Call me. We need that for the church, don't we? And even if my spouse can be my best friend and, and I can say, hey, I'm struggling with something, then that's great because it gives me an opportunity to have to pray for somebody. They can't fix me, but they can help me. And folks, I don't know anything else because when I've been anxious about something, as soon as I talk to Dorothy about whatever I'm anxious about, it disarms the anxiety. That's why I do what I do in talking to people because once they name the emotion, it tames it. You name it, you can tame it. You take sin and you get rid of it in the name of Jesus by helping another person get through theirs too. James 5 says that. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We need each other and we need each other more in the last days. Do not forsake the assembling together. I know that is hard online to do that. But thanks to your social media, you can respond, you can ask for prayer, you can still be connected in this community just because you might be at your home or you might be a shut-in or something like that. We can still make contact to get the help that we need. The last thing, because I got yelled at by Pastor John uh, for being too early last time, so I need to keep you for another half hour. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, I ended a little early, so I'm going to stall. Now, here is... No. The third thing, but I, I really think that this is such an important thing, is we need spiritual familiarity. I, I was thinking about this term as I was putting this together, and that term just came to my mind. Spiritual familiarity. In other words, we need to be just as familiar with God's presence in our lives that the first thing we do is to go to Him. He needs to be so familiar in our lives. <laughs> don't, get this, don't get this wrong. You know, when we get a headache, where do we go to first, Motrin or Jesus? It doesn't mean that Motrin is wrong. You understand what I'm saying? But we're trained to go right to fleshly human uh, correction first, right? If you have a problem with a person, or if you have a problem in your own emotions, or in your thoughts, do you go to Jesus first or you call somebody and gossip? Maybe it's time to go to Jesus. Maybe he has to become so familiar in your life that it's the first thing you do. Oh, I need, you know, you get a flat tire. Who do you go to? I'm going to call to Jesus. But folks, you know how you do that? You know, Lord, thank you. Because maybe I wasn't supposed to be where I was supposed to be. You know, instead of kicking the car 
and saying, this is the worst time in my life to have a flat tire, we still give praise and glory to God no matter what we're going through. Because he loves us and he will help us through whatever crisis we're going through. Spiritual familiarity. We need to be so engrossed in spiritual development that we go to that when we're tempted. Because fleshly familiarity is too common. It is too easy when you're hungry to go to McDonald's. Keep our focus on Jesus. I, I just want to share this because it, it came up when I was talking to somebody recently. And he was talking about, I don't understand why God wasn't there to stop me to do this whatever sin he was doing, right? I don't understand why God wasn't there to stop me from sinning. <laughs> and, and this thing hit me in the head. I mean, I, was, I had to feel it because I didn't think it was a rock. But I know what the Lord does. I know what he does. He plants thoughts and he, and he, and he works through me. And, and so I heard this in my head. And it was this. God speaks to us. If decibels were from 1 to 10, God is always speaking at a 10. But we may only hear it as a 2. God is always speaking to us. There had to have been something in your life that he was tapping you on the shoulder and saying, don't do that. And I really do believe that as I've contemplated it. God speaks every single day. If you open your word, he will speak to you. If you listen to nature and you see God's love through the animals, through the birds, I mean, God, has, has, he's there. You look at the lilies of the field, it's, it's something that says, I am here. You are much more valuable. You will hear God. You will see God. If you quiet your spirit as Elijah did, you can hear that still, small voice, but it takes a quieting down. So powerful. What makes it a two for us is our distractions, our, our, our fleshly familiarity, our negativity, our disbelief, our refusal, our filters, our discouragement, and we don't hear God's word. Don't ever leave. Don't leave here. And don't go on in your day here today if you're in online and think that God stopped talking to you or God isn't directing you. It is that we are not listening to him. We need, instead of, you know, accusing God of not saying anything, maybe we need to say, Lord, give me better antenna <laughs> to pick up the word. And that's what we're talking about here today. God's love is so great that he wants to deliver us. I want to end with this scripture. It's a scripture that most people think, that is not true. We have a lot of yeah, but syndrome here for this one. You know, yeah, but that's not for me. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. When you talk about the flesh... No temptation, and the Greek word also means trial, has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. In other words, everything that you experience, somebody else has and somebody else will. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tried beyond what you can bear. And most people, yeah, that's a lie. I can't stand up under that. God's going, yeah, but I died on the cross. And you can't stand up under that addiction. God's got the power. That's what he's saying. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. You can't just declare, I'm not going to handle this. No, God will not let you. Why? Because when you are tempted or tried, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. That's his love. <laughs> That's his love. Praise the Lord. Aren't you excited? You don't seem to be right now. Just kidding. We're going to pray. And uh, just 
This Christmas season, I just want you to focus on Emmanuel, God with us, and that being an incredible manifestation of God's love for you. Amen? Let's go to the Lord today. Lord, we're just thankful for your word. I thank you, Lord, that you are able to deliver us, that you have power, but not just the power, you actually have sympathy and empathy. You know exactly what we're going through. You resisted everything. You were without sin. And you did it for us. So we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Lord, may we saturate ourselves in the word. May we get help from another in our battles. But may we become so spiritually familiar with you that it's the first place we go. And we develop that strength a little bit at a time. We develop it. But thank you for your power. Thank you for your anointing. And we give you honor and praise for this time here today. Just be with us through the remainder of the season. Protect us from the COVID. Keep us and those that are touched by it. You heal in Jesus' name. So we honor you, thank you, and praise you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.